as Franciscan City Immaculate, our only desire is to spread love and devotion to the Blessed Mother. And one of the best ways to do that is to do so in light of the great spiritual masters. Nobody has articulated these rules of discernment like this great spiritual master, St. Ignatius of Loyola. But real quickly, in his life, St. Ignatius of Loyola was a very worldly man. He had great ambitions for knighthood. And during a war, he got hit by a cannon on his leg. So as he was recovering, to pass the time, he was trying to find books on chivalry. But divine providence had it that in that house, there were only two types of books, the gospels, the lives of the saints. There was no iPhone. Oh boy. So to pass the time, he read the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. And in his interior life, thoughts started to come. Why can't I do what St. Francis did, St. Dominic? But also worldly thoughts of worldly ambition. So there was a tug of war. And eventually, he went to the statue of Our Lady and he surrendered his worldly ambitions to serve God completely. And he actually gives his sword to Our Lady. You saw that statue. And we actually have his sword. That's a big sword. You don't mess with St. Ignatius prior to his conversion, okay? It's a humongous sword. And for him, in his spiritual journey, he slowly articulates these rules and guidelines of discernment. What is the sermon of spirits? He says this, rules for becoming aware and understanding. To some extent, the different movements which are caused in the soul, the good to receive them and the bad to reject them. And these rules are more proper for the first week. First of all, it is being aware. It is understanding. And thirdly, it's taking the proper action. So being aware of the spiritual movements in our hearts, in our thoughts, understanding, work with them until we understand what is of God in Our Lady and what is not of God in Our Lady. And the end game is to act accordingly, accepting what is of God in Our Lady and putting that into practice while rejecting what is not of God and what is not of Our Lady. The end game is always doing the will of Our Lady. Remember, there are fallen angels who are trying to influence you to not do the will of Our Lady because they want you to be where they are in hell. But there is also the victorious queen who crushes the head of the serpent who wants you to be where she is in heaven. Now here's a question. Wouldn't it be helpful if there were certain guidelines to help us discern these movements? We actually have, again, 40 rules, guidelines, concrete guidelines to discern this. Okay, we're going to engage the text now. This is a classic that, for our purposes, I'm just going to introduce you to these rules. But this is something you can always go back to. We're just going to look at the foundational rules and then specific rules that I don't want you to ever, ever forget. Let's start with the first rule. One of the most famous conversions after that of St. Paul is that of St. Augustine. This is the image just before his conversion under the fig tree. If you read his confessions, you'll actually be able to, to see what was going on in his heart. For our purposes, it's important to put it into context. So before this whole time, he was leading a very disordered life, but grace was slowly working in his soul. Our Lady was giving him those actual graces. Now, he gets to this point where he has to make a decision to convert or not to convert, to remain in a state of sin. And we have the grace to be able to peek into his heart because he actually wrote it in the confessions and see what was going on. So listen to what he says. 
in my youth, I burn to fill myself with evil things. I dare to run wild in different and dark ways of passion. Doctor of the church, everybody. This was the nature of my sickness. I was in torment, twisted and turned in my chain. I hoped that my chain might be broken once for all because it was only a small thing that held me now. He was almost there, but something was holding him back. And you, O oh Lord, never cease to watch over my secret heart in your stern mercy. You lashed me with the twin scourges of fear and shame in case I should give way once more. In my heart, I kept saying, let it be now. Let it be now. And merely by saying this, I was on the point of making the resolution. I was on the point of making it, but did not succeed. Almost. I was held back by mere trifles. All my old attachments, they plucked at my garments of flesh and whispered, are you going to leave us? We shall never be with you again forever and ever. You will never be allowed to do this thing or that forevermore. These voices seem to reach me from behind, plucking at my back, trying to make me turn my head when I wanted to go. Tug of war. Notice that. The first two rules consist of the person or the soul's fundamental spiritual orientation. There are only two directions in the spiritual life, towards God and Our Lady and away from sin, or towards sin and away from God and Our Lady. Now, why are these rules important, these first two rules? Because according to the fundamental direction of the soul, the different spirits, the fallen angels, Our Lady, they, their tactics will differ, okay? Here's the first rule. In persons who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy is ordinarily accustomed to propose apparent pleasures to them, leading them to imagine sensual delights and pleasures in order to hold them more and more and make them grow in their vices and sins. In these persons, the good spirit, so for our purposes, Our Lady uses a contrary method, stinging, stinging and biting their consciences to the rational power of moral judgment. Let's unpack that real quick. So you see, for those persons who are moving from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy, as St. Ignatius tells us, is ordinarily accustomed to do what? Propose apparent pleasures, leading them to imagine sensual delight is going to be good. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. And the end game is to trap them in sin. And what does St. Ignatius tell us? For those who, persons going from mortal sin to mortal sin, our lady's method is contrary, stinging and biting their consciences. See, this is the mercy of God. This is the only way to wake them up and get them out of their disordered life by stinging their conscience. Does this happen today still? Absolutely. Here's an example. Abby Johnson, if you read her book, she actually describes the moment of her conversion. Remember, she was doing the ultrasound guided abortion. As I took the ultrasound probe in hand and adjusted the settings on the machine, I argued with myself. Notice the tug of war here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to take part in an abortion. No, wrong attitude. I needed to psych myself up for this task. I took a deep breath and tried to tune it to the music from the radio playing softly in the background. It's a good learning experience. I've never seen an ultrasounded guided abortion before, I told myself. You see the tug of war that's going on, right? Maybe this will help me when I counsel women. I learn firsthand about this safer procedure. Besides, it will be over in a few minutes. I could not have imagined how the next 10 minutes would shake the foundation of my values and change the course of my life. What happened? Her conscience was stung. That is a grace from Our Lady. Let's look at the second rule. 
In persons who are going on intensely purifying their sins and rising from good to better in the service of God our Lord, the method is contrary to the first rule. For then it is proper to the evil spirit to bite, sadden, and place obstacles, disquieting with false reasons, so that the person may not go forward. And it is proper for Our Lady to give courage and strength, consolation, tears, inspirations, and quiet, easing and taking away all obstacles, so that the person may go forward in doing good. So you see here that for persons who are now moving towards God through Our Lady and away from sin, notice the tactics of the different spirits. St. Ignatius tells us, for those intensely purifying themselves from sin and going from good to better, the enemy now bites, saddens, places obstacles, disquiets with false reasons. You can't do it. Are you sure? Here's an example. Here's a person who is going from good to better, St. Juan Diego. You remember when Our Lady told him, go to the bishop with this message. The very first time he went, the bishop was very skeptical. So he was completely discouraged to the point where he told Our Lady, I beg you, my lady, queen and my little girl, to send one of those nobles who are held in esteem and respected with the message so that it will be believed. For I'm a man of no importance. You're sending me to a place that I'm not used to spending my time. My little virgin, my lady, forgive me if I grieve you and you are angry with me. Who is disquieting with false reasons, placing obstacles, saddening? And what does Our Lady do? Listen to me, my youngest son. For know for sure that I do not lack servants and messengers to whom I can give the task of carrying out my words, who will carry out my will. But it is necessary that you plead my cause and with your help and through your mediation that my will be fulfilled. You see, Our Lady now gives courage and strength, consults, inspires, and then she takes away all obstacles. You see then? That's exactly what happened to St. Juan Diego. So the first two rules consist of the person's and the soul's fundamental direction and spiritual orientation. The first consists of when a person moves away from Jesus and Mary and goes moves towards sin. And the second is when a person moves towards Jesus and Mary. And again, that's very important because according to the fundamental spiritual orientation, the tactics differ. Rule number three and number four consists of the two basic movements in the interior life. Consolation, desolation. Consolation, desolation. This is very important because we need to expect both spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. That in itself is not a problem. The problem is not being aware not understand it, and hence, not taking the proper action. Let's look at rule number three. St. Ignatius says, the third is spiritual consolation. I call it consolation when some interior movement is caused in the soul, through which the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its Creator and Lord, and consequently, when it can love no created thing on the face of the earth in itself, but only in the Creator of them all. Likewise, when it sheds tears that move to love of its Lord, whether out of sorrow for one's sins, or for the passion of Christ our Lord, or because of other things directly ordered to His service and praise. Finally, I call consolation every increase of hope, faith, and charity, and all interior joy that calls and attracts to heavenly things and to salvation of one's soul, quieting it, and giving it peace in his Creator and Lord. Wow. Let me just unpack that real quick. So the first thing that we need to do is to, first of all, distinguish spiritual consolation from non-spiritual consolation. 
as St. Ignatius points out, spiritual consolation is always directly associated with the life of faith, with our spiritual life. Non-spiritual consolation is, can have psychological factors or bodily factors. Feel great at a Texas breakfast today. That was great. A lot of consolation, non-spiritual consolation. So first of all, we need to distinguish these two. At the same time, we need to also be aware that they often overlap. Here's an example. Her sister, Pauline, so she's the one on the top right, she recounts this episode in the life of St. Therese, okay? Descending the steps leading into the garden, she saw a little white hen under a tree, Therese, protecting her little chicks under her wings. Some were peeping out from under. Therese stopped, looking at them thoughtfully. After a while, I made a sign that we should go inside. I noticed her eyes were filled with tears, and I said, you're crying. She put her hand over her eyes, and I cried, I cried even more. I can't explain it just now. I'm too deeply touched. That evening, in her cell, she told me the following, and there was a heavenly expression on her face. This is what St. Therese said. I cried when I thought how God used this image in order to teach us his tenderness toward us. All through my life, this is what he has done for me. He's hidden me under his wings. Earlier in the day when I was leaving you, I was crying when going upstairs. I was unable to control myself any longer, and I hastened to our cell. My heart, get this out, was overflowing with love and gratitude. You see here how God uses non-spiritual consolation and then ele elevates it to spiritual consolation. She saw those little checks and then immediately her thought went to God and how God protected her in her life and she was spiritually consoled and moved to the point of tears. For spiritual consolation, there are different intensities, so they can be very gentle or very strong. And also, the duration can be brief or very long. So this is very personal, right? So St. Therese was moved by little chicks. She's a woman. For men, don't not move anybody. God needs to use something else to move us towards spiritual consolation. It's very personal. You see, Our Lady knows her children well and gives, her, gives them spiritual consolation in their personal capacity. Huh? Very important. So that's the third rule. The fourth is of the other movement, spiritual desolation. I call des desolation all the contrary of the third rule, such as darkness of soul, disturbance in it, movement to low and earthly things, disquiet from various agitations and temptations, moving to lack of confidence, without hope, without love, finding oneself totally slothful, tepid, sad, and as if separated from one's Creator and Lord. For just as consolation is contrary to desolation, in the same way the thoughts that came from consolation are contrary to the thoughts that came from desolation. So again, even for spiritual desolation, we need to first distinguish spiritual desolation from non-spiritual desolation. Non-spiritual desolation can have bodily factors or psychological factors, right? When you're sick, often you don't feel well. When there's psychological problems, so too, the same thing. Spiritual desolation is directly associated to your spiritual life. First, need to distinguish them, and at the same time, we need to be aware that they can often and do often overlap. Here's an example. Three children of Fatima. When Our Lady started to appear to these tr three children, they had the interior certainty that this was something from heaven. But then, certain things started to be, certain things in their home was agitated. Here's what Sister Lucy actually said. I began then to have doubts as to whether these manifestations might be from the devil, who was seeking by these means to make me lose my soul. As I heard people say that the devil always brings conflict and disorder, I began to think 
that truly ever since I had started seeing these things, our home was no longer the same, for joy and peace had fled. What anguish I felt. Whenever the enemy of our soul inflicts us with spiritual desolation, oftentimes it interprets our spiritual past. You remember when you did that? You remember that sin in your past? It predicts our spiritual future. So you're, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get closer to Our Lady? You'll never make it. Four rosaries? Too much. Can't do that. It presents itself as our spiritual identity. You'll never make it. It gives us a sense of shame. It also a sense of isolation. You're the only one experiencing this. And then there's an irreparable damage. You'll never make it. You will never, ever be healed from this. You see, with spiritual desolation, it's very serious because it is a heaviness of heart that brings, tries to bring us down to paralyze us completely. Again, we need to be aware of this because we need to expect spiritual desolation. But that's not the problem. The problem is not being aware, not understanding that it's part of the spiritual, spiritual life, and hence not taking the proper action, rejecting it completely. So just like spiritual consolation, spiritual desolation also has different intensities. It can be very gentle, it can be very strong. It can last very briefly. It can last a very long time. To recap, the first two rules consisted of the person's fundamental spiritual orientation. That's important to understand because the tactics of the, the spirits differ according to the orientation. And then the third and fourth rule consists of the two interior movements in the soul, spiritual consolation, spiritual desolation. St. Ignatius says, God, one of them, consolation, God gives. The other, he permits. Why? So we can grow. Because in Our Lady, we are already victorious. So he puts the devil to shame. He permits those spiritual desolations. So through Our Lady, in union with her, we can overcome that and crush the head of the serpent in his pride. So the first four rules are the foundational rules that help us be aware and understand. The following rules after that is now to take the proper action. Since we don't have time, we're just going to look at those rules that I don't want you to forget. Okay? Here's the first one. The fifth rule. In time of desolation, never make a change, but be firm and constant in the proposals and determination in which one was the day preceding such desolation, or in the determination in which one was in the preceding consolation. Because, as in consolation, the Good Spirit, Our Lady, guides and counsels us more, so in desolation, the bad spirit, the devil, with whose counsels we cannot find a way, to right decision. You know, oftentimes, he's very dense, St. Ignatius. Lots of words. Well, basically, what he's trying to say is this. In times of spiritual desolation, never make a change to any spiritual proposal that you had in place before the desolation began. Here's an example. Do you know what this is? Blessed Bartolo Longo. Great saint, great blessed, okay? In his life, to cut a long story short, as he grew up, he, he fell into uh, the occult, okay? He was very anti, became anti-Catholic. And there was a certain point where he actually became a satanic priest. Whoa. But Our Lady and her Holy Rosary saved his life. So after his conversion, his reversion to the faith, do you think the devil will easily just let him go? Absolutely not. So there was a certain point after he is converted where he experienced deep spiritual desolation. Here's what he says. 
One day, in the fields around Pompeii, I recalled my former condition as the priest of Satan. I thought that perhaps as the priesthood of Christ is for eternity, so also the priesthood of Satan is for all eternity. So despite my repentance, I thought, I am still consecrated to Satan, and I am still his slave in property as he awaits me in hell. As I pondered over my condition, I experienced a deep sense of despair and almost committed suicide, intense spiritual desolation. And what saved him? The words of Our Lady, one who propagate, propagates my rosary shall be saved. Our Lady and her rosary saved his life. He made the proposal to spread her rosary. And in time of desolation, he remembered his proposal and he continued and never made a change. And because of that, he did great things for Our Lady and for the church. He actually built a whole beautiful shrine. If you go to Pompeii, this is dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary. You gotta go, you gotta go. This is, look at that, look at that, beautiful. Never change your spiritual proposal in times of spiritual desolation. So in the fifth rule, you're asking fundamentally when you are in prayer, am I in time of spiritual desolation? Am I thinking of changing a spiritual proposal that was in place before the desolation began? If the answer is yes to both questions, you know where that's coming from. The enemy of your soul. So it's important to be aware that yes, there's spiritual consolation, spiritual desolation, but there's also tranquil time. We're not always in the highs or in the lows. But for this rule, once you identify that you are in spiritual desolation, the action is in time of desolation, never, ever make a change. Here's the sixth rule. If we're never to make a change in time of desolation, the sixth rule is about how we change ourselves in relation to the spiritual desolation itself. So what do we need to do? Here's what St. Ignatius says. Although in desolation we should not change our first proposals, it is very advantageous to change ourselves intensely against the desolation itself. And he gives us four concrete means, as by insisting more upon prayer, meditation, upon much examination, and upon extending ourselves in some suitable way of penance. In the Catholic spiritual tradition, there is a very important fundamental distinction between spiritual desolation and passive purifications. Spiritual desolation always comes from the evil one and hence needs to always be rejected. The passive purifications is the gr a grace from God where he shares his cross with us and since that is from God, we need to accept it and carry our cross. The four means, remember, that he gives us is prayer, meditation, much examination, and suitable acts of penance. If you want to just simplify it, if you want to use one concrete mean, just pray the rosary. Intensify your prayer of the rosary because it's prayer, meditation, much examination, and a suitable act of penance. It is not always pleasing when you pray the rosary, but it's a suitable act of penance. Now, here's an example. Imagine this guy at work, terrible, terrible day. His boss was just yelling at him, non-spiritual desolation. It's a bad day. This guy proposed that when he gets home, he will pray the rosary 6 p.m. But now, throughout his day, he had this terrible day. He's in non-spiritual desolation. He gets home, and then the devil uses that non-spiritual desolation and brings him to spiritual desolation. What happens? 6 p.m. rolls around, and he stops praying his rosary. He changed 
his proposal. And instead, what does he do? He gets on the computer. Click, click, click. Boom. Pornography. Impurity. Sinfulness. From non-spiritual desolation to spiritual desolation to sin. In times of spiritual desolation, never make a change to your spiritual proposal. On the contrary, intensify. Never be passive. Intensify your rosaries. Here's someone who was in a lot of spiritual desolation. And what did he do? Pray the rosary. Look at that picture. He's like, why are you even bothering me? I'm praying the rosary right now. He won the spiritual battle through the most holy rosary. Rules 1 to 4, foundational rules. 5 to 14, taking the proper action. The end gain is to do the will of Our Lady. Here's another uh, division. So from rules 5 to 11, right? So taking the action, proper action, it's St. Ignatius teaches us how to act in spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. In the last rules, rules number 12 and 14, he teaches us how to act during temptations. That's very important because the devil only has two tactics. It's either temptation or spiritual desolation. What's the difference? The, the basic difference is spiritual desolation is always unpleasant. It's a heaviness of heart that tries to bring us down. Temptation is very pleasing to the fallen human nature. But whether it's spiritual desolation or temptation, the end game is always not doing the will of Our Lady and trapping you in sin. Okay, so we'll just look at one rule for how to act during temptation. It's another one I don't want you to forget. Likewise, he conducts himself as a false lover. So he's talking about the enemy of our soul in wishing to remain secret and not be revealed. For a dissolute man who, speaking with evil intention, makes dishonorable advances to a daughter of a good father or to a wife of a good husband, wishes his words and persuasions to be secret. In the contrary, this pleases him very much when the daughter reveals to her father or to the wife, to her husband, his false words and depraved intention, because he easily perceives that he will not be able to succeed with the undertaking begun. Okay, here's the important part. In the same way, when the enemy of human nature brings his wiles and persuasions to the just soul, he wishes and desires that they be received and kept in secret. Don't tell anybody. But when one reveals them to one's good confessor or to another spiritual person who knows his deceits and malicious designs, it weighs on him very much because he perceives that he will not be able to succeed with the malicious undertaking he has begun since his manifest deceits have been revealed. Let's unpack that really briefly and we'll look at three elements from that rule. First of all, the signs. Secondly, the persons. And third, the content. So how do we know that we are being tempted in this way? Secondly, who are the persons that we need to go to? Thirdly, what is the content that we need to reveal to those persons when we are aware and understand that we are being tempted in this way? Here's an example. St. Therese, everybody knows that the only thing St. Therese wanted to do with her whole life was to enter Carmel. She moved heaven and earth to be able to enter Carmel. She prayed, sacrifice, that so she actually went to Pope Leo XIII, begging him, please, let me enter. This is her only desire. This was her only desire. Now, when she's a novice and she's in retreat, on retreat, just before her profession, she starts doubting her vocation. Maybe this is not my vocation. Maybe I am being deceived. I'm deceiving myself. Now imagine if St. Therese was not aware, did not understand, and did not take the proper action. Would we still have a St. Therese? But here's what St. Therese did. 
she actually went to her superior and she revealed that temptation. And this is what happened. Fortunately, she saw things much clearer than I did. And she completely reassured me. The act of humility I had just performed put the devil to flight since he had perhaps thought that I would not dare admit, admit my temptation. My doubts left me completely as soon as I finished speaking. So what happened was, the superior was in choir, so they were praying in the office, and St. Therese asked her to come out. You don't do that, you know, normally, especially in those times. And then she revealed her doubts to her superior. And what did the superior do? She simply laughed. You, Therese, you don't have a vocation? And then she said, the moment she revealed this to her competent superior, the devil was put to flight because of her act of humility. So the signs are, number one, spiritual trouble of the heart. When certain temptations or newly found doubts surfaces into our own life, some trouble of the heart, and at the same time, a resistance to speaking with the appropriate spiritual persons. Oh, they don't have time. Oh, they won't understand me. They, they can't figure this out. When those two things are sim simultaneously present, we know who that's from. The enemy of human nature. St. Ignatius says, we need to go to one's good confessor or to another spiritual person. Go to someone that knows your soul well. This is why spiritual direction is so very important and frequent confession is so very important because those spiritual pastors, the pastors know your soul well. And when you reveal these things to the appropriate spiritual person, whether you're your confessor or your spiritual director, they have the grace of state to be able to guide you. This is Our Lady guides you through these, uh, these competent spiritual persons. And what do we reveal to these competent and appropriate spiritual persons? St. Ignatius tells us, the wiles and persuasions of the devil, deceits and malicious designs, malicious undertakings of the enemy, manifest deceits. Don't hold back anything. Let that your spiritual director know everything that is troubling your heart. So, the last rule that we're looking at is in time of spiritual trouble, never, do not keep silent. Tell your spiritual director or your confessor. Okay, so let's wrap this up with a recap. The first two rules, tactics of the two spirits. The fundamental spiritual orientation of the soul is important to be aware of because again, the tactics of the different spirits, the devil and Our Lady, differ according to the spiritual direction of the soul. Then there are the two basic spiritual movements. Again, the Sermon of Spirits is very concrete because it helps us be aware, understand, and take the proper action in doing the will of God and rejecting the deceits, the spiritual desolation, and the temptations of the devil. Deepen your spiritual life, not only to know these things, but to take the proper action, to do the will of God. Because when you do the will of Our Lady, you will be victorious when we ponder these things in our heart, in union with Our Lady, in union with her Immaculate Heart, we too will participate in that triumph. Amen.